the theme of the exhibit, the main theme, is a, is a question. It's an important question. It's a huge question. The question is, what does it mean to be human? And so, yes, the exhibit is about scientific research and the discoveries that have come from fossils and archaeological digs and from uh, the study of genetics and understanding um, other living creatures. Um, but this theme is much larger than, than all of that. Uh, this question, what does it mean to be human, is informed by many different perspectives. It's informed by religious understandings. It's affected by and influenced by philosophy, uh, by literature, the books that we read, uh, by the arts in general. It's a question that's informed by um, everyday experience as we're growing up. And also, there is something that science can contribute to this as, as well, uh, that deepen and enrich our understanding of who we are as a species and why it matters to learn about it. Uh, at the same time, it's a, uh, a subject that can be very challenging. In fact, I would say downright troubling uh, for many people. Uh, and uh, the clashes that occur in culture about science and religion or various philosoph philosophical perspectives are ones that are uh, often difficult and challenging for, uh, for, for people to, uh, uh, to wrap our minds around and to, uh, and to grasp. And so the exhibit here is meant to be a, a respectful and welcoming place to understand some of the scientific discoveries, but also to give voice, to give voice to this question, your answers to the question of what does it mean to be human. The goal of our tour, of a, when we're going to uh, 19 libraries throughout the country over two, a two-year period, and uh, Orlando is the second place where we come, come to, and it's great to, great to be here. Um, but in that tour, our goal uh, is to nurture, to nurture with your help an, an open and civ civil conversation um, about this uh, profound and, uh, and challenging subject. We ask the question, what does it mean to be human? Uh, all of the uh, answers that are going to be posted on the board here in the exhibit are going to appear also on the uh, website on its own place just for Orlando. Um, and so that'll be interesting to kind of look at what kinds of answers we get to that question from different, uh, different parts of the country. Um, and we also have lots of content on the science, uh, human origins. We have uh, 3D um, fossil specimens that you can rotate around and take a look at them and archaeological finds uh, relevant to the study of, uh, of human origins. And also resources developed by our broader social impacts committee. I come from Washington, D.C., so I almost said BSIC. We have to have an acronym, don't we? This is where I live for about two to three months out of the year. Uh, it's, uh, it's in the, the Rift Valley uh, in southern Kenya in East Africa. It's an unpronounceable name, almost. Alorgasaili is the name of that. It's a Maasai uh, word. And uh, I've been doing research in this uh, location, do, running digs there uh, for the past um, this year will be 30 years. Uh, and, um, and so we get together a whole team of, uh, of all the different ologists, paleontologists, archaeologists, and uh, people who do geological studies, geological dating, chemists, physicists, and so on, uh, who, uh, who work uh, in helping to understand the environments through time and the changes in stone technology over the last one million years of time uh, that this uh, site goes back to. Uh, there are volcanoes. Does it have a meaning? Alorgasile, no one really knows the meaning. It means it's derived from a Maasai word that means the place of, that's the ol, ol means the place of, the place of the Gesilic people, but no one knows who they were. Uh, so <laughs> does that have a meaning? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> like, okay, that's right, yeah. <laughs> Whatever, yeah. <laughs> Uh, in any case, and so uh, the digs that I run there um, have produced things like uh, this. This is a, happens to be an excavation of a, a fossil elephant, that, uh, an extinct form of elephant. Uh, this is a site that goes back to uh, 990,000 years ago, um, and it has butchery marks on the skeleton. It's surrounded by over uh, 
2,300 stone tools, sharp stone flakes and hammer stones that were used to make the flakes. And it's a spot on the landscape almost a million years ago where early humans uh, aggregated um, and I'm sure it attracted the interest of other animals as well, uh, scavengers of various sorts, um, to, uh, to uh, uh, get uh, the meat off of this, uh, of this particular animal. Our excavations have spread over a wide area um, showing that this was a grassland area at that time a million years ago, but there has been a, there's been a lot of environmental uh, change that one can see through uh, all of those, uh, those different layers that, uh, that, you, that you can see in a general way in this, uh, uh, this landscape shot. There's, there's, my, there's my, where my tented city is, right up there on that cliff. So that's the view I get uh, for usually about two months out of the year, going back there in, uh, in June. But I'm coming back in the middle of it all for seven days to go to the next library. I'm very committed to this project. So the, uh, the study of human origins is carried out by uh, international film, uh, 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 film teams, international scientific teams. Um, and I do work not only in uh, various parts of East Africa, but also in, uh, in China. I do prefer the warmth of the uh, African landscape compared with some of the times when I've been in China. Uh, but, um, but these are uh, people who have many different cultural backgrounds, many different language backgrounds. They come from different nations, of course. And science is a way, as an effort, to um, uh, try to communicate findings about the world that go across those different perspectives. Um, in addition, um, there, this kind of work, these international uh, uh, scientific teams uh, have uncovered many, many different uh, objects relevant to the subject of human origins. Um, actually, this, this picture does make me laugh inside. It's, a, it's my office. And, um, and one day when I was away, a good friend of mine who's a tremendous photographer uh, came there and took all the books off my shelves and uh, uh, populated them with the objects that were about to go into the Hall of Human Origins at the Smithsonian. He then tried to put the books back, and I shouldn't say this in a library, but it's a mess. It's never been the same ever since. Uh, but in any case, it's a pretty impressive uh, photo uh, that shows uh, the fossil, uh, uh, parts of the fossil, human fossil record, um, going back six million years in time. There are about 6,000 fossil individuals that are known. Uh, from that time period relevant to the subject of human origins. For a vertebrate, uh, living vertebrate species, that's not a bad fossil record. But when you add to it that there are tens of thousands of archaeological sites that show that basically the calling cards left behind by early humans that I was here, I made this tool, um, and that tell us about the changes in technology and the behavior, the activities of those early humans. It's really quite a remarkable um, record of our early ancestors. In addition to that, there are uh, um, art objects. For example, this is the, one of the oldest known artists' palettes where uh, pigment was ground into the, uh, uh, into the, the flat rock uh, before it was blown onto a cave wall. Um, and uh, also archaeological remains show us evidence of, uh, of hearths and shelters that also tell us about the behavior uh, of, uh, of, our, uh, of those early ancestors. Uh, this is a field of um, really rapid paced discoveries. Uh, frankly, I'm not quite sure how we're going to keep track and updating all the new finds that are uh, going to be made and have, have already been made during the two years of this tour, but we do have in the exhibit a, um, a panel that's called What's Hot in Human Origins? And those can include fossil discoveries like these almost two million year old um, skeletons from, uh, from South Africa. One of the areas that's incredibly um, rapid growth industry in this uh, area of science is ancient DNA. And it's astonishing to me um, when I think 10 years back that we would now have a complete map of the Neanderthal genome, of DNA that has been extracted from uh, fragments of fossil bone of Neanderthals, um, giving us a map of the Neanderthal genome. And what that genome shows um, is that, um, that all 
uh, non-African people uh, today have some Neanderthal fragments of Neanderthal DNA in them. Uh, and uh, that this was the result of um, uh, mating exchange of genes that occurred when Homo sapiens populations were first um, spreading, they were spreading within Africa, but also spreading outside of Africa, and ran into um, Neanderthal populations, uh, and um, uh, and had sex with them, and and this is what's responsible for having uh, DNA in uh, non-African um, uh, genomes. But again, they're just fragments of of DNA. Uh, it wasn't a whole lot of interbreeding that was going on, and for 10,000 years after that, there was no signal of any kind of exchange like that, no kind of hybridization. Uh, that occurred, again suggesting that while um, they, there was some interbreeding possible, that largely Homo sapiens and Neanderthals were separate species. There were separate gene pools uh, from uh, um, uh, Neanderthals were separate from Homo sapiens. Anyway, fascinating area of, uh, of research. And so the science of human origins even now includes uh, the work and contributions from um, people working on ancient genomes, uh, ancient genetics. When you put a lot of this work together, what you see is evidence for the accumulation of human qualities over time. And so we have here, for example, um, uh, represented in a uh, floor mat in the exhibit, um, more than three and a half million years old, three individuals walked across a volcanic landscape, leaving their footprints behind, uh, as well as the footprints of other animals recorded uh, in, that, uh, in that particular um, ancient landscape. This is a, a great find that was made by Mary Leakey and her team in the, uh, in the, the 1970s and 1980s in particular. Um, just five skulls here representing about two and a half million years of time with Homo sapiens on this end and two and a half million years over here. An arc that just in, very, in a few fossil skulls uh, shows the changes in brain size and the size of the brain case and, this, and it, its expansion over time and a decrease in the size of the face. Our species is the only one that has, uh, is the only um, mammal, any vertebrate in fact, that, where the face is tucked in under the front of the brain case. And so when you see that, that's how you can tell you we're dealing with a Homo sapiens skull as opposed to an earlier human skull or one of our, our fossil cousins uh, where the face is hafted on to the, to the front of the brain case. Two and a half million years of uh, technology represented in just a few objects here, these early stone uh, cores, um, st st flaking of stone tools uh, that's shown here at back at two and a half million years. Um, this hand axe, hand axe technology lasted for an incredibly long time, more than um, a million years of the same technology, um, layer after layer that we find in archaeological sites. And, and when you look at today's technology and how quickly it changed, the idea of the technology staying around for a million years is just really hard to wrap our minds around. Uh, but so it was. And we also have then much later on in time the world's oldest sewing needles. These come from China. These are about 32,000 uh, years old. And of course we have the, uh, uh, toward the end of the story, um, the explosion of art and symbolism. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, uh, later on. So we see this accumulation of human-like qualities uh, over, over time. And this is something that came up in our earlier uh, conversation, um, that uh, we also see that our um, family tree, our evolutionary tree, is diverse and branching, like the evolutionary trees of almost all other organisms. Uh, and so rather than an inevitable line of, uh, single line of progress, uh, that we have a diversity of species, and they have, represent ways of life that are no longer existing on Earth that we have a family tree that has, um, has had that possibility of so much extinction in it, of the extinction of lineages. And yes, some of them were ancestors of us, but we are indeed the last ones around. And that gives a kind of a interesting uh, perspective on um, our, and time depth to understanding of ourselves as a species. We are just one species, we are worldwide. 
We also have uh, plentiful end of evidence that where human beings connect to the history of life on Earth is through the primates, um, with um, chimpanzees sharing the greatest amount of DNA uh, with us of any other uh, living organism. Uh, we're familiar with DNA from television shows like CSI and other ones that DNA tells us who we're related to. Well, that continues to occur as one studies the DNA of all living creatures and helping us to see the kinship, the connectedness that exists among all, among all creatures. And so in this area of understanding, in this area of scientific investigation of human evolution, the basic ideas there is that there is kinship among all organisms, that there's this connectedness that occurs, and it occurs due to a process of change that has occurred over time with humans descended from a series of ancestors that we share with other organisms back through, through time to the beginning of life on Earth. Now that's an idea, this connectedness among all organisms is not an idea that some people enjoy. Um, but nonetheless, um, I can tell you from a lot of personal experiences and discussions as I've gone around the country, um, even in a workshop that I was at a conference that I was at uh, three weeks ago uh, in Washington, D.C., that brought together uh, 100 scientists and 100 Christian evangelicals, that, um, that it, was, it was beautiful. I know we want to laugh, but no, it was, it was really, really a, a beautiful in that there is uh, e many people, including people of deep religious commitments and insights, who see this idea of kinship and connectedness of all organisms as an area of good conversation with evolutionary biologists. And that's, I think, a, a hopeful uh, way of, uh, of looking at this and building, potentially building bridges and opening up um, you know, respect, respectful conversation. Now, the idea of change through time makes sense for a lot of different reasons. And one of them is that the Earth has changed a lot. Um, over, uh, over time. Now it could have been that when the idea of evolution was first contemplated that we might have found evidence that the earth had been um, stable and enduring for a, in a single kind of stable state for a long period of time. But that's not what has been found. What's been found is that there has been a lot of evidence of fluctuations in this particular line, this one showing from seven million years to the present of an overall trend toward cooling of the planet through natural processes, but also a great deal of fluctuation over time between, uh, wet, between uh, warm and, uh, and, and cold, warm and cold, and also from many records, all environmental records in Africa, where a lot of our evolutionary history took place, between wet and dry, strong fluctuations between wet and dry. And so um, it makes sense then that there were adaptations that developed new ways of, um, of behavior, new ways of life that were able to take hold um, in response to the changeability of the environment. And so we see as environments change between wetter and drier and between uh, cold and warm, that, uh, um, that there would have been certain advantages to, um, to new ways of interacting. Uh, with the world, uh, including ways of interacting with one another in our social, in those early human social groups. Now, with all the benefits that would have occurred due to these adaptations that I've just mentioned, that one of the hallmarks of evolution is that anything that's good also has some consequences to it. And so, yeah, walking upright, it's a great way, it's a very efficient way of moving around um, uh, across the environment. And it enabled the advantages of carrying things, of being able to do things with our, with our hands. And that had also enormous consequences in terms of the adaptability of those early ancestors to uh, a changing world. Uh, but we've all had, well, I can't say all of us, but many of us have experienced back pain and fallen arches and what can you say? That's the result of putting all of the body weight, not on four limbs, but on two. And the same thing with regard to arthritic uh, ankles and toes. My wife just had to have a toe operation to remove arthritis from her toe. She's fine. Um, 
I, this is being filmed. I should never have admitted that. I never <laughs> should have said that she had an operation. In any case, um, and uh, a whole variety of things. And we can actually see evidence of these sorts of things in the fossil record, um, just as you would in any kind of forensic case. Uh, but we, we see these disadvantages that come with the advantages of particular adaptations. Another example, eating meat. Yeah, a great source of protein and fat, really important for um, the, uh, the energetics and the nutrition of those early ancestors of ours. Its meat is quickly digested compared with plant food, but it led those early ancestors into the dangerous realm of other predators. Uh, and meat spoils quickly, it contains parasites. There are all sorts of other consequences to this. And so this, uh, the idea that there are benefits, but there are also disadvantages or costs is one of the hallmarks of that. Actually, one of the favorite ones, one I should have put it on this slide perhaps, is that you know, what I'm doing now, and we're talking and you're listening to me, and I was listening to you earlier on, and um, by, in order to talk the way that human beings do, to create speech, we have to modulate the sound and a whole variety of different sounds very quickly. And one of the things that's important for that is the descent of the vocal tract in our, into our, deep down into our throats, allowing a lot of space for the um, manipulation, modulation, as linguists would say, of, of the different sounds in a rapid-paced way. Well, that's great. Language is cool. We can do a lot of things with it. It's great survival value if I want to share with you some information that you don't know, okay, or that, hey, we should plan to do something. But human beings are the only animal that can die by choking on its own food. Now, talk about a disadvantage. Um, and it's, now babies don't have that problem. Their, their vocal tract is high. And so that's why they can, um, they can nurse and breathe at the same time. Okay. But by around the age of one and a half and two year or two years old, the, the vocal tract lengthens and the vocal cords are brought down uh, into, the, into the throat. And as a result, when food passes down into the esophagus and the stomach, you have to have, we have a mechanism that closes off the airway, but sometimes it doesn't work. Okay? And when that doesn't work really precisely, then food can get trapped. Um, and so, I mean, talk about an enormous disadvantage, but the advantages of speech clearly were able to overcome that possibility, that, that, that cost of evolving such, a, such an amazing structure and, a, and the ability to, to speak uh, with one another. Well, one of the things that I've mentioned here is a lot of stuff about time. Well, how do we know things about time and the age of things? Well, field work is critical in all of this. And so in my field work, we see, for example, in Africa, um, volcanic ashes or layers of volcanic eruptions, and those volcanic eruptions had radioactive particles. They have radioactive particles in them that came from the eruptions from the volcanoes. And so the, um, uh, the calculation of the rate of change from one chemical element to another chemical element is what we depend upon among many other kinds of dating methods in places like East Africa and other parts of the world. There are about 12 different dating techniques, aging, age estimating techniques that are applied to the time period of uh, human evolutionary history. They are checked and cross-checked against one another. They are different um, uh, systems of physics and chemistry that are independent of one another, but when they cross-check and they agree, well then we think we have got a, a really solid and accurate date. Uh, for uh, the, the dates that I'm, that I'm giving you and showing you and that are explained or shown in the exhibit uh, as well. So you can, um, you can uh, calculate the rate of change in, in uh, radioactive elements, chemical elements. You can count the electrons that are trapped in rocks and fossils. That's another way. Uh, you can um, um, compare the um, magnetic particles in sediments to well-established changes in the direction of Earth's magnetic field, which are well dated. Um, you can also, of course, compute um, rates of genetic change, uh, which have been done in comparing humans with other living creatures, or now humans with Neanderthals, and uh, probably a growing number of fossil species uh, that, will, uh, that, that the geneticists will be getting uh, uh, genetic material out of uh, in the future. 
And so when you put all of this evidence together of fossils and archaeological remains um, and, um, and the dates together, what we see is a series of changes over, over time. I know that this is a little bit hard to read in the back perhaps, but this starts around six to two million years ago. MA means millions of years ago. And from bipedal walking and then later on we see from the scratches on the teeth an increase in the range of the, of the diet and the breadth of the diet, the kinds of foods that were eaten. Simple stone flaking coming in about 2.6 million years ago. Um, although there is a find that has suggested that, that may go back a little bit earlier. Um, that was just um, announced uh, about two weeks ago. It hasn't been published yet, so you'll be seeing more about that in the next few weeks. Uh, two million years ago, extensive carrying of food and, and, and stones, um, elongation of the legs, advances with hand axe technology, and then Ka here means thousands of years ago. This is just over the last one million years. During the last one million years was the most rapid increase in brain size relative to the size of the body, control of fire, shelters, complex mapping of resources and the exchange of resources, symbolic behavior, and the, the diversification of ways of being human, cultural diversity, has emerged over really only, only the last 100,000 uh, years. And so we see this series of changes over time, and these milestones are things that you can explore in the exhibit. Yes, sir? What is the complex spatial mapping? Yeah, comp I, you know, I'm going to get into that in a, in a moment in the, uh, one of the examples that, uh, that I'm, I'll talk about. And if I don't bring it up, those exact words remind me. That would be great. Um, so um, the exhibit um, explores these themes, and we hope that you will take the time to, to look at uh, these, uh, these major themes in the, uh, in the exhibit and discoveries. Uh, that bear on this. Um, I invite you to, uh, to tell your friends about it and to, uh, I hope, will lead to fun and interesting conversations about this, uh, the subject of the science of, of human origins. What I'd like to do in the remaining time we have together is just take brief uh, examples here that will show how discoveries can connect to things that are actually meaningful about our, about our lives. Um, and those three vignettes or short stories have to do with sharing and caring, with brain, babies, and parenting, and innovations and complex symbols. And that's it's the latter one where we get into the complex uh, mapping of, uh, of resources and space. So let's first deal with sharing and caring. And, um, you know, as you were um, all giving me your ideas about uh, what does it mean to be human, I couldn't help think. And I'm glad I put this one up here because no one mentioned it. It's my favorite example of what, I, of, uh, what it means to be human. I know this is a little bit odd because there are many things one could say. But what I'm illustrating here is that when we go out and we find food, we don't eat it right away. How odd is that? I mean, hardly any other organism does that, okay? Yeah, sure, birds go out and they will bring back, you know, food to their nests to feed their young, and other organisms do that. But adults feed other adults in the human species, okay? And we'll share even with people who we don't even know. Um, and that's pretty, that's pretty wild. And so when I go to a supermarket, I hardly ever start ripping open packages and sit down and start eating. I take it someplace else, okay? And why, why do I take it someplace else? Is because I bring it to others to help feed them, and sometimes they feed me, too. And that's really pretty, pretty cool. And so this idea of sharing is a very, very unusual thing. And so you might wonder, well, can we say anything about when that occurred? Uh, in, in human origins. And in fact, some of our excavations in, in Kenya on the shores of Lake Victoria, a different site from the first one that I showed you, uh, where back at around two million years ago, which is where the, this, this dig, the time period of this dig right here, that we have found a really neat evidence that shows an early toolkit that consists of hammer stones, a rounded piece that was used for hitting other rocks, uh, called a core and producing sharp flakes that could fly off. And what we see are cut marks on the animal bones, butchery marks that are shown there. And on the stone tools, we, we see microscopic wear indicating 
that there was um, uh, that the, the early humans at that time period were processing uh, tubers, that they were cutting uh, underground um, uh, tubers like a, a potato, uh, not a potato exactly, but uh, roots and things like that that are very nutritious, much as meat is as well. But we also see from looking at the chemistry of the stone tools that were brought to this particular site that the stone was carried up to eight miles away from where it could be gotten. Okay, and so, and the animal bones that are there are from several different environments. They're not from just there at that spot. And so that indicates that those early humans two million years ago were bringing things. They were delaying their eating of food for some reason, and they're bringing it to a central place. And so we think that this may be a, a little signal of the beginning of this human propensity to not eat food as soon as you find it and to bring it to some other place to share it. The oldest toolkit that we see at that site, that's Kenjera. We also, I've also worked at Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania, a site made famous by the, uh, the, the Leakey family working there in the 1960s, uh, that, um, that we see this oldest toolkit. And with this oldest toolkit, you had sharp edges that could cut as you know, even better than a carnivore's canine tooth, a, a lion's canine tooth. And you had hammer stones that could pound and crush food better than an elephant's molar. And once stone tools came into existence, once that invention occurred, it was a great way to be able to accommodate to the changing menu in a, in a changing world and being able to have basically all the food stuff of the African savanna open up to those early ancestors. And so with even such a simple technology like this, the simplest technology that we, can, that we can think of and have ever found, that taking that early, early technology began a process of um, dispersal, again, not only within Africa, but also to parts outside of the African uh, continent. And so the oldest spread of our genus, the genus Homo, as in Homo sapiens, the name of our species, um, between 1.9 and 1.7 million years ago, a little bit after 2 million years ago, uh, occurred. And so armed with that simple technology and that ability to uh, share food, that's as much as we know that they had and allowed a great success of, those, uh, of, the, of that early human, probably the species known as Homo erectus, which had evolved by about 1.9 million years ago. Now, Note this site, Dimenisi, and there's a really interesting fossil that comes from there. There are five fossil skeletons of Homo erectus that come from that site, uh, dated between 1.8 and 1.85 million years ago. By the way, I throw around these numbers so easily, and yet it's such a long time ago. Um, but uh, this is the, uh, the skull that I'm thinking of, and it's an old man from the site of Dimenisi. It's in the Republic of Georgia. Uh, and this, his particular skeleton is dated to 1.8 million years ago, 1,800,000 years ago. And what do you see that's unusual? Well, he has no teeth. And the bone is actually resorbed, okay? Which meant that he lived for many years without any teeth. And many, many scientists and a variety of other investigators looking at this think that this could be, this could be one of the earliest signals of an individual helping another individual. Basically, someone had to chew his food in order to, for him to digest. Um, he had no teeth and probably had no teeth for, him for about uh, five to seven years. And yet the individual lived um, and eventually died, obviously. Uh, but, um, but so could this be an, an inkling of that human capacity, that profound human capacity, to care for one another, to have responsibility of one, one individual for another. We don't really know the answer to that. But certainly a, uh, an equally or perhaps more compelling find is much later on. This occurs, the example I'm thinking of is in Neanderthals. And this particular cave, Shanidar Cave in northern Iraq, uh, 65,000 years old, 65,000 years ago, this particular individual, a male individual, died at about the age of 55, 50 to 55 years of age. Well, his 
left side of his skull, it's the right side of the screen, but his skull, his left side, was, um, was damaged at a very early age. He had a, a, certainly a concussion, but basically a flattened area of his brain case, right by the frontal lobe of the brain, where motor coordination, the ability to move, would have been deeply affected. The whole, the right side, or the left side of the, uh, of the brain controls the right side of the body and vice versa, okay? And so damage to the left side of the brain meant that his entire right side of his body was withered. It, could not, it did not develop. And this occurred, based on the amount of development of the bone, occurred at probably about the age of eight years old. But he lived to 50 or 55. He was not a functional individual in that, in that society. And yet, clearly, was taken care of by others in the, in the social group. And so this idea, I find it interesting and surprising that um, as I became aware of these discoveries and, and in my own work, that this combination of sharing and caring is something that we can actually see in the, uh, in the fossil and archaeological record, see evidence for. The second uh, example, again trying to do this quickly, is um, brain, babies, and parenting. I think we all have to admit that it takes brains and a lot of energy to raise, uh, raise kids. Um, and, um, well, babies. Babies are fat. Um, that's, we, we cannot argue with the fact that babies are fat. And babies are fat. They don't have the same kind of fat that we do, I mean that adults do. Uh, we have white color fat and babies have brown color fat. Brown color fat has a lot of mitochondria in their cell. Those mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. And they are able to convert energy very, very quickly, mitochondria do, and that's what brown fat is all about. And the reason why is that babies are doing a lot of energetic output, and a lot of that energetic output has to do with their brains. Now, we as adults, when we're resting, I don't want to say like what you're doing. Now, I hope you're not just resting, but, <laughs> but when you're resting, um, about it, our brains are about 2%, 2% of our body weight but they take up about 20% of our energy just at rest, okay? Now, as an organ of the body, that's not a very good deal, except our brains are really important for a variety of reasons that you can think of. In babies, that's 65%. 65% of their resting metabolism is just taken up by the growth of the brain, <laughs> which is astonishing, um, and so they are, they, we are an energy-hungry species, any way you cut it, just by virtue of having a large brain. Um, and, you know, it makes sense that there would have been, bef you know, before brains really start to get large, that there were these transitions to more nutritious foods, uh, uh, foods like um, bone marrow rich in fat, uh, animal protein, uh, tubers, um, that were very, very nutritious, and that the sharing of food took place as well. Yes? On that same one, so you showed the, the picture of the Homo erectus. Did they cook their food, or was that? No evidence of cooking at that, at that stage, at that early Homo erectus. So but I'll get to that in a moment, too. This is great. He's, yeah, yeah, I should take you on the road. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, please. It's kind of complicated, but, but I read that walking upright bipedally interfered with childbirth. Yeah, yeah. It's not, it wasn't something I was going to get into, but that's one of the costs and benefits things as well. That, that you know, walking upright has great advantages. Again, freeing the hands. Think of all the things I've even just mentioned with regard to caring and sharing that require the hands. And yet, one of the costs of that is that in walking, the whole idea of walking in an, effect, in an efficient way is to keep the center of gravity moving forward as gradually as without swaying back and forth as much as possible. And so the center of gravity passes through the center of the body. The hips have to be brought in um, more widely, which means that in, in females and in males, but in females, the birth canal is, is, is a constraint on it. And so with large-headed babies, that becomes a, uh, a, a real issue. Um, but again, babies have, are building all those big brains, okay? Um, we all did. Um, but brains do a lot of different, uh, a lot of different things. Uh, that I've just kind of uh, exemplified in this particular, uh, particular chart. 
Um, and we depend upon all, all people, all of us, because we have large brains, um, depended upon some reasonable degree of parenting. Uh, of, uh, of adults taking care of us in order to, uh, to, to grow, to come to uh, fruition as, uh, as, as adults in our lives. And not only parents themselves, but also extended parenting, which is a characteristic of uh, human beings too. So with regard to growing up human compared to other primates, humans have what we call a long, a prolonged life history. We see this compared with our closest living genetic relative, uh, chimpanzees, where you see that becoming adult, adulthood is reached at about 13 years of age, about 18 in humans. And by the way, I apologize and am offended also by the fact that old age is defined as 50 years. That's, that's, that's just not right. I, I really must change this slide. Um, in any case, human beings are also unusual in having a, um, <clears throat> among all primates and among all animals, of having a childhood phase of growth that even after we are weaned, after we are able to, to have food and we could go out and get it, that we're still dependent upon adults feeding us, okay? Um, not all the time, but throughout most societies that, that is the case. And also adolescence. For better or for worse, humans are the only species with an adolescence, that is with a growth spurt that occurs. And that's because during childhood, there is actually a slowing down of growth. But then there is this catch-up phase called adolescence. Some of us underwent it more than others. Um, and, um, and then before adulthood uh, is, uh, uh, is, is reached. And so what we have there is that growing up human takes longer. There is unique childhood and adolescence phases. We have grandparents too. Uh, and the brain takes a long time to grow up and is energetically expensive. Now, is there any way in which uh, scientists have found to figure out when this occurred, when this slowing down of growth took place? And it's really clever recognizing that teeth start to grow, our, our teeth start to grow when we're in the womb, okay? And the teeth are laid down, the enamel of the teeth, that outer covering, is laid down one growth line at a time, and it's daily. One growth line equals one day. And this is well established from looking at a wide range of, of uh, organisms. Um, and microscopic techniques have been able to, uh, to, to study this in detail in living organisms, as well as in, of course, counting the, uh, the basically like tree rings. Uh, in, a, uh, in a tooth. And so what this means is that we have an internal timekeeper in our tooth growth, one growth line each day. Okay, not only that, but there is a birth line. Birth is the most stressful thing in terms of our skeletal growth that anyone ever goes through. On the day of birth, growth actually, including the laying down of enamel, is stopped. And so there is, in a microscopic picture of any given tooth, the actual day of birth is recorded. We have a birth certificate stored in our teeth of the day we were born. Um, and that temporary halting of the layering of tooth enamel on birth means that you can then count the number of days toward the completion of the growth of this tooth and its eruption in the mouth. Okay, and that allows us to figure out how long it took for this tooth to grow. Yes, please, sir. It's a good question. I do not believe it is, but I do not know the answer to that. The question is whether it's true for a C-section birth, and I don't, I don't know. Um, but in fact, not only in humans, but also in Proconsul, which is a, a fossil ape, 20 million years old, that's the day of its birth of this 20 million year old in, uh, individual that lived 20 million years ago. And so from studying the first molar, that's the molar, the first molar erupts about what age in us, the first permanent molar, around six. Around six, we sometimes call it the six-year-old molar. Okay, and that, um, uh, so you can actually look at this, that molar and other and fossil humans and figure out, well, how long did it take that tooth to grow? Did it take six years to grow from the time of birth? Well, when we look at a, a broad range of, uh, well, 
several uh, great apes and humans, that we see that the first molar erupts, and you can see that it takes longer for a Homo sapiens molar, first molar, to, uh, to erupt than that of other, uh, and all other primates, actually. But when you look at fossil humans, and these are different species names, and the ages of them, 3.2 million years ago for Australopithecus afarensis, that's a species, the most famous uh, find is what's called Lucy. There's a skeleton known as Lucy. She lived about 3.2 million years uh, ago. Africanus, Homo erectus that we've seen here, and these are the ages of specific individuals. And it's only in the last 1 million years that we see in Neanderthals and Homo sapiens a real slowing down of growth. Why was, that? Like Why was that? That's a good that's a good question. Well, hmm, what are some of the things that I've just mentioned? Brains. Okay? The most rapid rate of brain growth, that is sorry, brain evolution. Most rapid rate of brain evolution relative to body size was in the last 1 million years. And so you have this correlation that makes sense of brains getting larger and, and uh, growth, the pace of growth slowing down, and that they are correlated with one another. And with, as you look through all of the primates and through pretty much all the mammals, that brain size and growth rate are highly and tightly correlated with one another. Is, is there a name to the science of uh, the, using the tooth layers? To... Is there a name for the science of using the tooth layers? Um, Clever science. So no, I uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, no, there's not really a name for it. I just went uh, just uh, two months ago to a um, a meeting in St. Louis where there was a session just devoted to this subject. It's but it's life history is what it's usually called. Life history studies. Because I was going to run to Google and, and study it more. That, uh, that yeah. Yeah, paleo, yeah, paleo is something. Yeah, but it, the overall the overall study of it, of of how fast growing up takes place is called life history studies, okay. and so you may be able to find something there. Uh, Christopher Dean, D E A N, and uh, Gary Schwartz are two of the colleagues who are at the forefront of this kind of kind of work. And so I put up this skeleton here. This is a Homo erectus that's dated 1.6 million years old. It's a beautiful specimen. It comes from northern Kenya. And this particular, often called the Turkana boy, uh, a male um, individual, and his second molar had erupted. And our second molar usually erupts around the age of 12, we sometimes call it the 12-year-old molar. Well, using this technique to look at the first and second molar of this individual, the second molar erupted at the age of seven and a half years old. And so a very modern looking um, skeleton in terms of elongated leg, legs. There are some other things that are not quite uh, human about it, like the way in which the shoulder joint is uh, positioned. Uh, but overall, a very human look, looking skeleton, but growing up at the pace of a great ape, which is pretty, uh, pretty amazing. So his brain wasn't very advanced then? His brain was, um, the brain size of this, this individual is about 800 cubic centimeters, which is about half the size of human beings today. Well, what's interesting also, what else was going on in this last million years? Well, we also see the very earliest evidence of hearths, of being able to control fire, and cooking. And cooking is something that does what? It releases nutrients in ways that you can't get just out of raw food. And so the idea of the control of fire may, and cooking may have been one of the things that was fueling this incredibly energetically expensive um, uh, evolution of a larger brain sizes over time. Well, I we need to back us up, but it occurs to me, when did they make this discovery about the dental stuff? Because this is the first time I've always heard of this. Yeah, yeah. Um, I first became familiar with it in a paper that Christopher Dean wrote in 1995, Nature. published in the journal Nature. Uh, but it has really developed a lot since then. There's a summary article that has been uh, uh, written by Gary Schwartz and Christopher Dean about this uh, just in the last uh, uh, few years. It's also what Daniel Lieberman wrote in the evolution of the human head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dan, Dan uh, goes into that, some of it, in his, uh, uh, in his book. There's a book that uh, uh, a colleague of ours, Peter Unger, who works on actually uh, dental toothwear to look at diet, 
he uh, is all, all in his book that's about to come out will summarize uh, some of this information as well. Also, uh, what was going on in this last million years is we have the oldest evidence of, of, uh, of shelters, of building shelters. Um, and so what's interesting to me about this is that there is a sense of this intensification this in of, um, of this concept of home and of safety and of sharing food at a home base that is represented by this evidence. And I think that when you look at this combination, this com combination of um, um, brain size, of control of fire, cooking, um, shelters, and the slowing down of growth, these represent real milestones in becoming human. And um, I think that they uh, speak to the emergence and the combining of qualities that, um, that are quite central to what we think of ourselves as human beings and our experiences as human beings. Um, very quickly, the last um, uh, vignette that I want to, um, to explain here uh, again goes back to my own uh, research in, in southern Kenya. Um, and, um, and in this uh, particular uh, area of southern Kenya, we've had excavations um, such, as, uh, such as this. And in those excavations, we find that in places like uh, most of this area here, we have layer after layer of stone hand axes, that technology that continued on for such a long period of time. But we also then have something different. We have a different technology that occurs right, uh, you, actually is visible in this excavation. And this is what you see at this site of Alorgas Haile. 1.2 million to 500,000 years ago, you have hand axe technology. But by 320,000 years ago, the hand axes are gone. They're no longer seen in, in, southern, in the southern Kenya archeological record. Instead, you have the beginning of innovations. You have a smaller, more diversified kind of uh, stone technology. You have a careful preparing of the core of the rock uh, in a very thoughtful way, such that with one strike of the hammer stone, you have time after time the taking off of these small rectangular, so, sorry, small triangular points. And these are so small and they show signs of hafting and of impact damage. These are the first, we think, these are the first projectile points. Things that fly through the air. And the world has never been the same since. Um, we also have evidence of um, the use of obsidian, a very rare uh, kind of rock in East Africa. In the hand axe time period, all of the rock that early humans used for making stone tool came from within about three or four miles away. When you get up to 320,000 years ago, most of the rock was made from, most of, the, most of the tools were made from rock that was coming from up to 100 kilometers away and was coming in as big chunks, not being struck down to little nubbins by the time you reach this place. And so we think that this is actually the beginning of complex resource mapping and exchange, trade. It's the beginning, beginning of awareness of a group that is far distant from you, that they have something that you want. And yeah, I guess there could have been a raid, but it didn't result in the use of that rock in those 100 kilometers, but rather it was brought en masse to this place. And so this looks like it's, it could be the beginning of exchange, the beginning of what we might call social networking um, in a paleolithic kind of sense of the word. Um, we also see evidence from these same archeological sites of coloring material, pigments. And that's really pretty cool. Pigments are often seen as symbolic, if you will, of symbolic behavior. In other words, the ability to color things. We think of the clothing we wear, the uniforms, or the colors on a flag, things that are part of our existence as symbolic, a symbolic species. And so coloring material is often seen as perhaps the beginning of this complex human capacity for being a symbolic uh, being. And so what we have here, and time is represented down at the bottom here from 280,000 years ago to, the, to near to 40,000 years ago, and that there are a series of innovations near the origin of Homo sapiens, a series of different uh, kinds of technologies that are done, uh, that are used, the long, long distance exchanged, 
um, a whole variety of different sorts of things like that. And I have to say, I have to, had to think of this when I was getting a tour in the library here of the Melrose Center, which is fabulous, just terrific place here that the technology and creativity uh, and innovation center here in this library. Well, this is the Paleolithic version of it. Um, and what's interesting to me is that all of this and the time, the oldest known Homo sapiens is right around 200,000 years ago, that this represents increasing innovation, wider social networks, complex symbolic activity, almost certainly, well, certainly including language, the ability to communicate with others about in ways that allow complex thinking and planning and awareness. And to my mind, this represents a greater capacity to just to many new environments that are occurring uh, in Africa during this, uh, this time period, a time of, of instability in the environment. And so what our work, and it's not published yet, but I wanted to share it with you anyway before it's published. Uh, we hope to be, uh, it's like getting cats to, or to cooperate. I'm getting 30 co-authors to try to write their papers um, right now. So I'm not waiting. I'm letting you in on this already, okay? But we're going to uh, take some of these things like long distance exchange points and so on back to about another 40,000 years, back to 320,000 uh, years before the present. I think, uh, from my standpoint, the ability to understand this and to study this in, in great detail is uh, one of the more interesting aspects and areas of human evolution studies um, that has come up in the last um, uh, 15 years. In particular interest to me is this oldest known coloring material. 320,000 years ago, we have ochre, red material and also manganese, which is what's responsible for creating black color in cave paintings. We have both of them concentrated at these archeological sites all the way back to 320,000 years ago. We have no idea what they were coloring. We don't have any objects that they did color. Maybe they put it on their skin as a way of identification of being a member of the group. We, we don't really uh, know the answer to, to that. But, they were found naturally in the rock? Hmm? Um, they, were, they were brought in, these, these lumps of pigment were brought in from elsewhere. We, again, we're trying to figure out what the source of that is. Um, one of the sources we think may be, again, about 60 kilometers away um, from, from this place. When you uh, study contemporary design, they still use black and red. Yeah, now. yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it absolutely is. And this is actually leads to, my, to this slide right here, and I don't know if you can see it very well, but. But, but coloring material is really the beginning of so many things that we think of as being beautiful and astonishing in terms of our appreciation of, of what things that people make and art, artwork. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner is what I like to call the world's oldest crayon. Um, it's, it, it doesn't fit into a packet of 64 very well. Uh, it's not exactly like a Crayola, but it has facets on it. It's, it's 250,000 years old from a site in, uh, in Zambia. Um, and there are several dozen of these uh, ochre crayons that are found at that, uh, that particular site. Uh, we have early representational art. This may be hard to see in the light here, but a figure that has sort of human-like legs, but, um, but a, 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 an animal-type body. Um, uh, this comes from about 40,000 years ago in a site called Apollo 11 Cave in Zimbabwe. Um, the, uh, this lion man figurine and the old, world's oldest known uh, musical instrument comes from a cave site in Germany 42,000 years ago. It's a pentatonic scale, a five note scale. Western music is a seven note scale, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. Um, and, um, it's a, but most, uh, most music throughout the world is a five note, is based on a five note scale. Um, so 42,000 years ago, we have lots of ochre um, coloring material used in burials. Uh, this is a burial a reconstruction from a site in Siberia where two, um, two young individuals um, died, and perhaps they were twins. Um, they were buried head to head, and they were covered with uh, tens of thousands of beads. Uh, the clothing that, that was, must have been on them was, must have been covered with beads and, um, and ochre sprinkled all over the, uh, the grave, so a way of commemorating. And this is one of my favorite examples. This is the cave art from Chauvet Cave in, in France. And uh, an amazing uh, one of the painted caves um, in, uh, uh, in, in Stone Age uh, France. This one that's particularly gripping is that you notice 
for example, with this woolly rhino here, that the artist um, put one figure of a rhino over top of another, over a top of another, over a top of another. They're slightly displaced. And the same thing with cave lions that they have. And the artists were putting them like not, not quite right, exactly like tracing it, but just slightly offset from one another. And the archaeologists came in there and they had their flashlights and they would look at this and go, we've never seen this before. 32,000 years old. Well, an official from the French Antiquities Bureau was coming to visit them. And they said, we're going to give this person a real Stone Age experience. And they lit flickering torches. And they went in there with the torches and they move. It's the first animation, which is just astonishing when they went in there and saw, and saw that. And there are aspects of actual the art in this cave that they thought was invented in the Renaissance. Nope, 32,000 years ago. They were us. They were homo sapiens. And so I think that these sorts of finds, these sorts of discoveries uh, do speak to, um, to innovation, to our creative abilities. Um, they speak to our profound capacity to um, uh, to be symbolic creatures, to imagine abstract reasoning, and including our ability to communicate and think about things that aren't visible in our immediate surroundings, things deep into time or things on the other part of the world. And these are very emblematic of, um, of that profound and, and uh, evolving human ability. And so I hope in this uh, presentation, uh, and I really appreciate your, your questions um, uh, on this, and I'm going to stay around for some more questions as well, as long as you want to. Um, I don't have to catch a flight till 7.30. Um, but I hope that, uh, that through the various, presenting the various themes of the exhibit and that through these different uh, vignettes that I've interested you, and I hope as you tell perhaps uh, friends and relatives about the exhibit uh, here, Exploring Human Origins. But in closing, I just want to um, have one final theme, major theme of the exhibit. And it harkens back to the, to the answers, the answers that you were giving to that question at the beginning of this talk about what it means to be human. And that point is this, that yes, scientific discoveries have uncovered a lot of things about the origin of our humanness, about our human abilities. And yet, all of us, when we try to use the word, when we use the word human and how we think about ourselves, are often thinking about things that are far broader, um, that are far broader than what the science of uh, scientific research on human evolution can study. And so exploring human origins, the exhibit here, is an invitation and I hope an opportunity uh, to ponder exactly how our lives, thought of in the broadest sense, in the ways that you were all talking about with regard to the question, what does it mean to be human? How our lives in the broadest sense and how scientific discoveries on our origins may meet and become acquainted with one another. Thanks very much.